Welcome to the Canine Decoded Show, where we discuss what it means to be a dog at all life stages and circumstances. We will look at the human dog bond and highlight current findings of canine science. I'm excited to have expert guests from around the world on the show to bring together our understanding of the species dog. And of course, I will give you practical tools for your everyday life with your beloved companion. I'm Dr. Melanie Ude, founder of Canine Decoded and your host on the Canine Decoded Show. Welcome everyone. This is the first episode in 2023 and we're going to start off strong with a topic that might be familiar to most of you, leash reactivity. This is one of the most common problems, behavior problems we see in dogs and is also one of the most complex ones. Throughout the years I have seen quite a bit. Uh, any kind of case that you can imagine, dogs that have been neglected, dogs that have been abused, dogs that have been chained for most of their life, dogs that have gone through very harsh training, dogs that have gone through no training, and everything in between. Now, here's something that gets me all the time. If I go on a walk with my German Shepherd or my Belgian Malinois puppy, sometimes I do see dogs that walk perfectly on a leash next to the owner. But the tail is tucked in, the head is hanging, and the dog barely finds the courage to look left or right or to be interested in anything. That is breaking my heart. Why is that? Well, they're afraid to leave the heel boundary, the boundary that the owner allows the dog to walk in. You're not allowed to be in front of the owner, you're not allowed to drag behind, you're not allowed to go left or right. And usually that has been harshly reinforced so the dog does not find the courage to do anything else. Well, leash reactivity is fixed, right? I've seen dogs that have been trained to walk in the perfect heel to a point where they even poop as they walk. They don't scoop to the side, they don't take a minute to squat and do their business, they walk and poop. And the trainers or the owners say, well, the dog respects you way too much to stop for its business. The perfect dog, the perfect heel. But the question is, does the dog enjoy the walks? Does the dog enjoy his or her life? Walks are everything for dogs. They explore nature, they sniff the ground, they smell the air, they see and hear other people, other dogs. And that's very, very rewarding for dogs. That's their life. They go for it. But on the other hand, I've also seen dog owners who do not subscribe to such harsh corrections, to such harsh training methodologies. And yet they come home really frustrated with their dog pulling on the leash, being reactive, frustrated to the point where they get angry, mad at their dog, hate going for walks, and then also feeling guilty that they feel that way. So in both cases, leash reactivity is a problem and it's the most common problem among all dog behaviors. Now, there are millions of tutorials. You can go to social media, how to train leash reactivity or how to train the, to have the dog walk on the leash rather, how to fix leash reactivity, how to do the heel, how to do it pure positive, how to do it balanced, millions and millions of resources. And yet the numbers do not go down. And dog owners as well as trainers around the world really ask me, why is that? What can we do? So I decided to do this special episode on the 11 factors that go into leash reactivity because it is a very complex behavior and it is important for all of us to know more and understand better what it is really about. And I'm gonna challenge everyone to avoid the quick fixes because our dogs, they deserve better and they deserve to enjoy the walks. So let's dive into it. Okay, let's start with the reactivity. I know some people say my dog is aggressive to other dogs. Others say my dog is not aggressive, but leash reactive. I think we kind of want to step away from labeling things because they kind of come with some, with some understanding of what that really means. Um, but in some cases, it actually takes us further away from truly understanding what the underlying issues is. So let's think about what leash reactivity means. So first, obviously, it has to do something with the leash. Now, dogs are mostly on the leash when they're outside, so it's probably meant to be equivalent to the behavior outside. Now, if you have a leash reactive dog 
and um, you train that dog to be perfectly on the leash, I think we all know that the dog can still be reactive or have um, aggressive reactions to certain triggers even though the dog has a perfect heel. So it is not only about the leash. And then let's talk about being reactive. Now the opposite of it would be proactive. If leash reactivity or in general this kind of behavior has progressed for quite some time, you can say that the dog almost becomes proactive. How do you know that? Well, I hear a lot and students that I work with, they tell me at the beginning, my dog reacts to other dogs even though they don't do anything. They just walk by, they don't even pay attention and yet their dog blows up on the leash. Now here the question is, is this reactive or is this being proactive and why? And even if we say, okay, it's still reactive to whatever trigger, is reactive actually bad? Or is it really a mechanism for the dog to communicate the discomfort? So you can see where I'm going here and what I really want to say is we focus way too much on the actual outcome, the behavior, but we need to start looking at what happens right before, what happens in the dog's brain what leads to that kind of behavior on the leash and consider all these factors that go into it because it is not just the reactivity on the leash which we are going to be exploring right now. If you want to learn more about the science of motivation and how you can leverage this to create a well-behaved dog, I invite you to join my free masterclass. You can check my website on canindecoded.com for dates and enrollment information. Factor number one, the environment. We need to consider our dog's behaviors in context of the environment. Now, that will help you to understand what motivates the dog to behave a certain way. Why is the dog doing what the dog is doing? The studies of ethology look at exactly that. It always considers an animal in its natural habitat and observes and try to draw conclusions from the observations to, to hypothesize or to come up with theories why dogs behave a certain way. The opposite is lab-created um, environments and observations. So one classic example would be B.F. Skinner, who um, pioneered the, classic, the classical and the operant conditioning in dogs with his experiments in labs. Now, both have their upsides and their downsides, but one of the things that happen a lot with lab observations is now, retrospectively, we know that there have been a lot of factors that influence the dog's behavior that we've seen in the lab that may or may not make the conclusions uh, tricky uh, to apply in real world. We didn't know as much about dogs as we do now. For example, the social bond to the handler is a very, very big impact factor. And I will talk about this at actually the last factor for leash reactivity later on. But because there has been a social bond between the handler or the experimenter even in those experiments in the lab, between that handler and the, the dog, that some of the results are actually more well, impacted by it. Versus um, ethology, where we try to observe the animals in their natural habitat without any influences, without any um, setups. Now, this is obviously a little bit harder, and especially for dogs, their natural habitat is in close proximity to us humans. But what we can learn from ethological studies is that there are really two motivators. There are three, but I'm going to just talk about two here that drives a dog, dog's behavior. Number one is avoiding pain. And number two is seeking pleasure. So when I say avoiding pain, I don't necessarily mean physical pain. I mean mental pain, discomfort, anything that just doesn't feel good to the dog or is in any way creating conflict. And seeking pleasure, obviously, um, seeking food or eating is part of it, but there's so much more. And these two principles, these two concepts are concentrated outside. So if you think about, there might be threats because the dog is exploring its territory or exploring new territory and without knowing who is there, who lives there, um, there's always a risk of threats. So avoiding pain makes the dog a little bit more vigilant, a little bit more curious about the environment. What else? Well, seeking pleasure, sniffing. Maybe you find food, maybe you some, find something tasty here in Atlanta. There's certainly a, um, a lot of chicken wings leftovers on the street. So there is seeking pleasure, sniffing out things. 
my dog Harvey loves to chase or at least observe squirrels that is seeking pleasure. So these very instinctual primal motivators of a dog's behavior are concentrated, elevated, really intense outside. And understanding both of them, where they come from, can help you set up the right training. In a different episode, I'm going to talk more about fear and anxiety, and in particular aggression. For now, I just want to emphasize dopamine. Dopamine is related to seeking pleasure and is something that um, I find very, very interesting and very fascinating. It can help you motivate your dog for peak performance, whether it's dog sports or actually rehabilitation. Seeking reward, feeling pleasure, happiness, these are all kind of human traits, but they do apply to dogs too. And they're actually quite complex in terms of what's really happening in the brain. Motivating pursuit, so the motivation to pursue reward, to pursue happiness, to pursue pleasure, to seek pleasure, it occurs in almost all species, at least in a rudimentary form. So they all have the capability to find blush pleasure and to seek pleasure. So they're motivated to do so. And the neurotransmitter, the chemical in the brain, dopamine, plays a very central role for this. And the system in the brain that is related to releasing, increasing, decreasing dopamine that arises in a very ancient rudimentary area that is located near the brain stem and it's called the tegmentum. Now you don't need to understand the nuances and the details of how um, the tegmentum controls dopamine release but it is central to the understanding of the motivation of dogs and especially its failure because the, the dopamine signaling can be suppressed by anxiety, it can be suppressed by fear and that interplay between being uh, seeking pleasure or avoiding discomfort that is now triggered in a different part of the brain, the amygdala, understanding that interplay is crucial and central to rehabilitating fear and anxiety and aggression, and especially in the context of leash reactivity. Or um, to phrase it very simple, we want to replace stress that comes with leash reactivity with dopamine, which is the, the pursuit of pleasure and happiness. So in summary for the environmental factor, it is very natural for the dog to intensely engage with the environment, especially outside, because it is concentrated in stimuli that either trigger seeking pleasure or avoiding discomfort. Now this is very, very different from the behaviors that are being triggered inside where most of the values, most of the things that mean something to the dog could be centered around you. Now you're the one who provides the food, you're the one who provides um, the toy, cuddling time, and all these things are centered around you. So it is, of course, way easier for the dog to engage with you inside because you're the one who provides the pleasure most of the time. And that changes dramatically as soon as you step outside the door, depending on the dog and the dog's personality. But we need to understand that there are instinctual drivers that make the dog behave a certain way. And it is dependent on the environment. And the inside and the outside are very different environments. Are you curious how to translate the learnings of this podcast into action? Join my Facebook group for more tips, tricks, and protocols. You can find a link to the group on my website on canindecoded.com. Factor number two, engagement. Now, if we take our dog on a walk, we want our dogs to enjoy it, right? This is a little bit of a timeout for us maybe because inside, you know, the dog has all the piled up energy, it's maybe a little bit more pushy and maybe requires a lot more supervision, but outside it is not the case. So outside, maybe you have more chances of um, just disengaging yourself and trying to enjoy the walk. And so does the dog. So what that means is there's kind of like different behavior expected from the dog outside versus inside. Maybe you give your dog a little bit more freedom when going on walks. Obviously the dog is on the leash, but you want the dog to engage with the environment, sniff, hear, and maybe you want to disengage a little bit more. But what that really means is from the very beginning, the dog learns that the expected behavior outside is to disengage, is to enjoy the walk and do not necessarily always engage with the owner. Now, 
once you start having a dog that is reactive on the leash, maybe you adopted a dog and you don't know what um, the rules and boundaries and expectations were before, but you want to have a very strict um, walk with your dog, or maybe you have a puppy and just let the puppy enjoy the environment, but later on the pulling becomes too strong, or you actually see the dog developing reactivity. Now, this whole picture for your dog changes because now you're starting to add rules. Now you go into trainings, like I need you to have a loose leash walking. I don't want you to look at this dog over there. Please don't jump up on people. It's not cute anymore. So you are changing the entire expectation of your dog of how to behave outside. Because now you're adding rules, you're adding boundaries, you're adding commands, which can be very difficult for your dog because your dog learned very different behavior from the beginning. So we need to understand that it's not just adding new behaviors, it's also breaking old habits so you can make new habits. Here's my little male puppy Anya. She's just finishing her um, uh, body stick and probably decided to make a guest appearance. So uh, <laughs> you can see she's uh, still very young and very excited. So her expectation right now is minimal, but she does have some rules. Uh, one of them is not interrupting the podcast. All right, so that obviously can lead to confusion. So if you have a dog that is used to walk a certain way, disengage, sniff to whatever, maybe go to the end of the flexi lead, and now you have completely new rules, we need to break the old habits and make new habits in a way that the dog understands and doesn't add too much confusion to it. And one of the ways to do this is obviously foster engagement. So when you want to add new rules, when you want to break old habits, the way to go is through engagement with you. So what is engagement? If you really think about it, we tend to set the foundation for engagement anywhere but outside. We like to train most of the things in the living room where you get the most engagement with your dog. Or maybe the backyard or maybe the front yard or wherever you go, but on walks, again, Normally we want our dogs from the very beginning to engage with their environment and enjoy. Now we have to change that and the dopamine that is being released in anticipation of a reward for pleasure, for happiness that you instill inside the house. We need to learn how to do this on walks before we add too many rules around how you're supposed to walk because it becomes very, very hard to maintain otherwise. And that requires a little bit of an advanced handling skill because food is not powerful enough to compete with seeking pleasure that is associated with prey drive or sniffing. So we as the owners, we have to become a source of seeking pleasure, but we have to have more advanced rules, sorry, tools um, outside of food so we can actually get our dogs to voluntarily engage and focus with us and then adding in all the obedience like heal, focus, is going to be so much easier because your dog is literally enjoying the process. Now we also have to be really careful to not um, do too much that is related to avoiding pain when we're going on walks. So let's say you someone who goes to the dog park and you call your dog. Now this is probably one of the rare occasions when you recall your dog if your dog is an adult. Now your dog will learn very quickly that whenever we call what that means is it's the end of the fun but your dog is seeking pleasure so rather than coming to you it will continue to stay out with other dogs and not come with you and this kind of fulfills both principles seeking pleasure and avoiding pain because the end of fun is if you will mentally painful. It's the same when your dog is running around in the backyard and you want the dog to um, come back. So you call your dog back in, maybe your dog got into trouble at the fence with another dog, and it usually means the end of whatever your dog was doing in the moment. The end of fun means avoiding pain if possible, so your dog might not listen to you. So understanding the behaviors, these two principles, seeking pleasure, avoiding pain, that it is concentrated outside in the environment and that our way to go is through engagement, focus, but we have to tap into these natural tendencies. We cannot rely too much just on food and we have to be very cognizant when we interact, communicate with our dogs to, be, to, to, to make this a good deal for our dogs at all times. 
And that environment engagement, these are just the foundations for dog behavior outside. I haven't even touched the actual problem of leash reactivity yet. But you can see how the engagement and the environment factor, how they go hand in hand. And we need to be careful that we don't violate our dog's expectations too much, especially if you were the ones who kind of set the rules or the behavior that's being expected ourselves from the beginning and then kind of change our minds as problems show up. So adding this kind of conflict and violating the expectations can add conflicts to a relationship and your dog depending on how sensitive your dog is, might get really confused. That brings me to the third factor, communication. I'm gonna use an example of puppies here because this is very um, prevalent or very common in puppies, but you can also apply this to dogs that you just rescued where you don't have a clear um, communication set up yet or you haven't really had the chance to build a strong bond. So for puppies, once we get them, they are often misunderstood. So we take them on walks once they're vaccinated. And oftentimes what happens, they are quite overwhelmed with the outside. Now, if they're overwhelmed, they're kind of left to their own devices because there is not a clear communication in place yet where you actually communicate with your dog. That's good, that's not good, don't worry, um, or engage with me. So we just talked about engagement. It takes time to put this in place, especially outside where there's so many um, triggers and environmental events. So a puppy now is kind of left to their own devices as in uh, what the puppy would do if feeling fearful or anxious. Now that sets the habit for behaviors outside and there's no way that we can communicate effectively with a puppy quite yet yes we will talk to our puppies a lot but they don't understand it yet that is very dangerous because now your puppy develops habits that are associated with certain environments like the outside especially if there are fearful events that startle the puppy or the puppy is actually you know not not very comfortable with other dogs and is too overwhelmed with meeting other dogs that become they can become dangerous because even if the fearful phase of a puppy is over if the behavior has been rehearsed it now can turn into a habit and breaking a habit and making habit is a lot more complex and a lot more difficult than setting the right conditions at the very beginning now, why is this so important for puppies? Puppies are like sponges. They learn so, 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 so quickly. And that comes back to what we call neuroplasticity. So the brain always changes. You can teach things to older dogs as well. I have helped rehabilitate dogs that are 10, 11, 12 years old. It just takes a little bit longer. And the underlying mechanism is called neuroplasticity. Without going into detail, it's a two-step process. So for one, it's what the dog basically per, um, uh, perceives in the moment. So whatever the training moment is, whether it's a command or walking outside, behaviors versus obedience, whatever the dog perceives, that is step number one. But step number two is that has, has to be followed by a certain amount of rest, because without the rest, it does not go into long-term memory. Now, this is also very important for puppies who are allowed to um, run around for too long because your training will not stick if you're not careful. So it's a very well balanced um, process between learning and resting. So communication is really important before you start any elaborate training, whether you just adopt, adopted a dog, um, you have a puppy, or even if you've had the dog for quite some time, you struggle with leash reactivity, going back to really revisiting the communication, how effective it is, and whether or not it's unambiguous, is important before you expose your dog to too much stress, challenges, and triggers. Okay, that brings me to factor number four, which is leash manners. So, leash manners, obviously, engagement is important, where you are is important, and having the right communication is important. Now, for us as dog owners, it is very custom to put a dog on the leash when we go on walks because obviously we don't want the dog to run away, get into trouble, run in front of the car. So seeking out experiences when you are on a walk is very natural for a dog. So it makes sense that the pace and the intention for a dog to go on walks is a little bit different than it is for us. 
So there's kind of like a conflict of interest. And one of the results of it is the dog pulling on the leash because we are technically not on the same page. So they're basically opposite ideas of how a walk should look like, right? We want the dog to walk nicely with us, but the dog is all about, I want to avoid loud cars, but I also want to sniff there. I want to say hi to these people. So it is very much the opposite. And that's a problem, but there are obviously ways for the dog to learn how to behave on the leash without losing motivation or without losing the pleasure that comes with going on walks. Now, one thing that we usually do is we default to tools. So there could be head halters or front clip harness, a prong or whatever tools there are to prevent a dog from pulling. But the interesting question here is, does that actually remove the conflict? Because you can stop the behavior, but the mental um, attitude, if you will, the state of mind is not necessarily changed. So what happens over time? The dog now is being prevented from following the natural primal instincts and frustration is bubbling up. Every time you go on the walk, it becomes more and more frustrating for the dog because either the dog cannot avoid discomfort as the dog would like to avoid or the dog, dog cannot seek pleasure as the dog would like to seek pleasure. Now, the leash itself can be an amazing communication tool. It's not just about verbal cues, but actually using it as communication rather than just something that prevents the dog from running away. But only if it's used in a way that aligns with the dog's capacity to understand and learn. And that mostly depends on the dog's age and experience. So how you approach it, how long it takes, how careful you are, how you communicate this, they all play a role in helping the dog to understand how to read um, the leash. And once the dog can do this, then leash manners, polite behaviors on the leash are a lot easier to teach and more importantly to maintain. And it can be difficult. So leash manners, not pulling on the leash is something a lot of owners struggle with because it is against the natural instincts or behavior that a dog would exhibit when being outside. But we can, um, we can work on this. Now something that I want to caution you is to fall into management. Just rely too much on, on tools to prevent the dog from pulling. Because for one, you kind of go in the direction of the example that I mentioned at the beginning where the dog is kind of forced almost to behave a certain way. You don't really remove the conflict. And the real question is, is the dog okay with that? Is the dog still enjoying, you know, walking with you? And if not, what are the downfalls? You know, there are obviously a lot of factors that go into exactly that question. Depends on the dog, depends on the personality, it depends on so many things, the experience. But really like, think about your dog going with you on the, on the leash, on the walk, on the leash. What is it that your dog wants? What is it that your dog can have? What is it what you want? And how much are you on the same page? If you want to read more about the main learning points of this podcast, you can always find a summary in the blog section of my website at canindecoded.com. Okay, so let's move to factor number five, the state of mind of your dog. So if you struggle with leash reactivity and your dog pulls and lunges and barks, at other dogs and you work on fixing that. You might have heard of the concept keeping the dog, the dog below threshold to reward the right behavior, the calmer behavior. And there's absolutely some truth to it. But more so in theory, it's the right approach. In theory, it should work. But the question is, what is actually the threshold? What makes us think that the threshold is uh, reached when the dog shows or exhibits certain behaviors. How do we know the threshold hasn't been reached way before? Just because we didn't see the behavior doesn't mean that the dog is not past the ability to actually learn. And here, the concept of compound stress is really, really important. Now, um, compound stress kind of piles up over the day but also across the weeks, the months, the years. 
So there's just so much stress a dog, a human really, can take before getting irritable, before blowing up at something that shouldn't be a trigger in the first place, because stress impacts our ability to stay calm. Now think of like climbing the stress mountain, you know, you climb up the mountain and every time you experience another stressful situation or every time your dog experiences another stressful situation, you climb higher and higher and higher. And once you're on top of the mountain, that's when you see the dog explode, blow up, lunge, bark, nip. That's when you as a human become irritable. Maybe you lash out at someone who just asked a normal question. So in the same way, you never start from scratch, from the bottom with each stressful event. It piles up more and more and more. You get higher and higher and higher. Now, it is important to understand that stress is not just being fearful or being anxious. Stress is also being hyper excited at all times. When visitors come in and your dog is super excited to see visitors, or when the dog is super excited to see other dogs on walks, that is stress too. Strict obedience can also be stress because being suppressed in natural instincts, as we talked in the context of engagement, environment and communication. So being suppressed at all times, strict obedience, strict heel, focus, everything, no freedom attached to it is also stressful. Imagine you go to work and your, your boss or your manager requires you to be focused and on point the entire nine hours. Now you're going to be really exhausted because our brains do not have the capacity to stay focused and to function like that for so long and neither do dogs. So that is stressful too. And it piles up over the days, over the months, over the years. So what that means is that potentially stepping outside the door is already so stressful, adding so much stress, compound stress, it's already so high the stress mountain that you're already past the threshold. The dog might not be blowing up right away or being in any way lunging, barking or obviously stressed, but it doesn't mean that the dog isn't in st stress or in the wrong state of mind to actually work, to actually practice, to actually learn. Now imagine, I'll give an example, imagine you walk in the neighborhood that you know is maybe not safe for whatever reason, but you walk through the neighborhood because there's a certain shop that you really like and you want to go there. It's in the middle of the day, there are other people outside, it's nothing too dangerous, but you just know it's not a safe, safe neighborhood. Now, you don't run through the neighborhood screaming or um, uh, clenching your fists or anything. No one knows or sees that you think it's a little bit uncomfortable here, but inside you do feel a little anxious. You're more vigilant. And that is stressful for you too. So imagine you have to go through that neighborhood every single day and experience that stress even though from the outside no one thinks that you feel that way. That is true for dogs too. So my point here is the whole threshold, wait until or right before the dog barks or lunges, that's when you reward calmer behaviors, might not be true or might not be very feasible because it is a lot more complex than that. And that might get you stuck if you stick to very common protocols without incorporating or accounting for all these other factors that go into leisure activity. So what do I mean really by state of mind? Here I mostly talk about emotions. I have talked about emotions in my second episode where I explain the foundations of how the, the brain works. But just um, as, a, as a brief reminder, uh, because they can get quite, quite complicated, emotions are reflected by certain neurochemicals that are increased or decreased depending on the environment that triggers certain behaviors. So if you feel happy, then you know, usually you're in an environment or in a situation where you feel content and it is, you know, mostly seeking pleasure, not so much avoiding pain. Now, if you feel really excited about something, you're really ready to go, um, that is also an emotion. But the important part is there is a, is a valence to it. So it's a negative or positive emotion depending on the context, depending on the environment. Now, if you, for example, you feel very sleepy and tired, 
but you're in a moment or in a situation where you have to be very active, that would be not good. But if you're ready to go to bed and you feel sleepy, that's good. And in the same way, emotions in isolation are good to understand, but even more so in the context of the environment. So this brings me back to the first factor. So as a dog owner, it is important to understand how to align the emotional state of mind with the environment. Now your dog can be super excited and happy in the dog park, playing all day with other dogs at daycare. So the dog is excited, there's a lot of adrenaline, there's a lot of dopamine, there's, there's pleasure, there's happiness. But you certainly don't want that when you're ready to go for bed, um, or there's some visitors maybe come over, you want your dog to stay calm. So the emotion has to be aligned. We need to set up our dogs for success in these moments. And if we understand that the state of mind right now is not the right state of mind, then this is our first training um, focus point, not all the behavior because the behavior are prompted by the underlying state of mind in relation to the environment. Okay, this is it for today. The remaining factors we're going to explore and discover in the next episode.